A fall vegetable garden needs planning and preparation. Annette Schrader visits an experienced grower to learn when to plant seeds and how to enrich the soil. This garden may be on a shady hillside with rocky soil, but the plant palette absolutely works. This backyard boasts 24 unique spots to sit and watch the many varieties of birds that come for a visit. And Tammy Allgood has an option to keep gardening even after joint pain becomes an issue. Come along. For the fall vegetable garden, you have to plan before you plant. If you're driving down the road in Tennessee in the fall and you smell the smoke from the tobacco barns and you want to plant a fall garden, guess what? You may be too late. We're going to talk to Tom Anderson and he's going to tell us how to plan what we're going to plant. So Tom, talk about the vegetables and, and the timing. The cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower, which you have right here. I, I plant those start them uh, inside so I can transplant, but I start them by the middle of July. Well, the weather starts getting cooler and you get so many leaves on them, then I will put them out. I transplant these about, because it takes around 13 weeks from the time you uh, start seed until time to maturity. Yeah, so. that's what I was gonna say. A cabbage can take 80 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you time that? Because as we go into fall, well, we lose sunlight, don't we? The days are shorter. That's right but it also gets a little cooler. The cool so, makes them grow. That's right, but it don't, you don't have to have coolness for them to, tra to germinate. All right, okay, that makes sense. I had that wrong. But I germinate them inside until, because if you, if you try germinating out here, then squirrels could dig in your garden yes. or whatever. So germinate them inside to get transplanting size, which is usually about four, three, four inches tall. And then I put them out here usually about uh, in August. Well, Tom, you have taken away your summer garden, it's quite obvious. Now, you started out with some barren soil. What did you do to prepare these beds for your fall plantings? Right here with the peas, I had tomatoes. Oh. I pulled the tomatoes out and I just added compost. I'll add three to four inches of compost. And I, I, I make my, a lot of my own compost. A, few, a little bit I have to buy if I run low. Well, you use a lot. <laughs> but but uh, I make a lot and I've still got, I've got compost bins sitting everywhere. Yeah. And so then I'll just put compost in here. So you- And I, I will, uh, the fertilizer I use, I like Joe's uh, the vegetable and tomato actually. Uh -huh. It has a high potassium number. Yes, that's for the fruiting low, part. Yeah, and, and a low nitrogen. Yes, so because you have no plant. That's right. If you use a lot of nitrogen, then you're just going to have a lot of green greenery. And exactly. No green. exactly. potassium. I use a little bit of vermiculite. I'll use it to, to lighten it up, lighten yeah. the compost up. It's a raised bed, yeah, raised so bed. you have good drainage. Yeah, perfect drainage. Well, Tom, let's say you grew green beans here. What do you do with those plants? When I get ready to harvest the green, uh, take up the green beans, I cut the vine off at the ground. Why is that? Because legume, which is what a green bean is, they collect the nitrogen out of air and forms on the roots. And you see the little white nodule around on the roots. Okay. So you, you cut it off at ground level and let keep the, nitrogen, the roots in there, but hold the nitrogen in the soil. Well, that, that's definitely good to know. How long ago did you plant these peas? Last week in August. Well, and we still had lots of good warm weather, didn't we? Yeah, but and that but that gave the roots time, time to, to establish. Yes. And now see that this last week we had cold weather. Yes. They jumped about six or eight inches during Isn't that, that one amazing? week. Yeah, just cause, of, and now it's warm again. So like I say, you can't control the weather. Right. But if you don't get peas started, if you start trying to start them now, they ain't going. They're make not going to grow. Exactly, and it's evident uh, the methods that you are using to plant. You've planned, you've prepared, and you've planted. And so from what we see beside us and behind us, we can tell the things that you've sown in the ground, and then obviously the collards, is that collards? 
Over here is collars, yeah. Yes, those were a transplant. That's transplant. And so they're already ready to be eaten. Well, matter of fact, I've already harvested one set of leaves off of them. We got them in the freezer. We want to take away disappointment. Whether you're a new gardener or a seasoned gardener, That's right. you want to plan to be successful with what we do. That's right. And I think you've given tips that will help even the seasoned gardener well, this morning. Well, I've learned a lot through my years. Exactly. From older people that Taught, how to, taught me how to garden, and I don't. I like to pass it along well, to everyone. Well, you're very generous, but both your physical labor and your mind knowledge. And thank you thank, so much. Thank you. Thank you. A passion for gardening vegetables is something that I share with my friend Pam Rice. So we're here in Nashville today in your unique vegetable garden that I can reach. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me, Pam, because, uh, you know, the older we get, the yes. more the ground becomes our enemy. <laughs> Hadn't heard it put like that, <laughs> but that's very true. Uh, I had started out with raised beds uh, that you see with just a landscape timber or two around the edge, but even that was not tall enough for me. So I bought these stock tanks and uh, I had a gravel bed put under each one and then I had someone drill holes in the bottom of these and they're just the perfect height for me. Absolutely. So you mm -hmm. got them nice and stable with the gravel. Right. And then you've got this full of dirt. That must have been fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bag at a time. Exactly. <laughs> but it makes it so that you yeah. can get to your plants. Right. Right. And work with them. Right. And, and what I like about it also is that it's positioned correctly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you're, you're not far away from where right. you're. Because I have an herb garden right across the way, and then I have my veggie garden right here. And Pam, you've not only used these containers, but you've used wooden barrels mm -hmm. as well. Do you mm -hmm. have a preference of which ones you like the best? Well, I like them both for different reasons. I like the barrels because I like a rustic look. Right. I like the stock tanks. They're galvanized metal. They don't rust and they don't disintegrate. <laughs> In time, uh, the wooden barrels have started, you know, to decompose just a little bit. Do you see that your plants like one or the other better? I have not seen that. Uh, of course, raised beds warm more quickly anyway, but the uh, ones in the stock tank, I suspect warm up more quickly because they are in a metal, right, metal trough. Well, you've made it so that gardening continues even though we don't want to. That's right. We don't want to get on. The, and if you That's have to right. get on the ground, you've got something very steady That's to right. help get yourself That's right. back up, right? That and my little gardening bench. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I love it, Pam. Thank you for the oh, innovation. Thank you so it's much. It's fun. One of the things that so many Tennessee gardeners struggle with is shade. Another thing Tennessee gardeners struggle with is hillsides, rocky slopes, clay soil. Well, today we're gonna look at a garden where this, this has all been conquered. Not only has it been taken care of, but it is just, this is a spectacular garden. We're in Brentwood, Tennessee, in the garden of Leon Olenek, who belongs to multiple societies and is obviously a serious plantsman. Every plant here, Leon, is just beautiful. It's just spectacular. Well, thank you, we work on it. and idea is something doesn't thrive, there's a whole lot of other plants we can put in its place. There you go. So, you know, that's part of what we work on. I used to try to save every plant, but I don't do that anymore. If it's well. if it doesn't work there, I'll try it in a different spot, and if it still doesn't work, then it's probably not the right plant for this area. Sure. Even though it might be a Japanese maple, and I've got lots of different Japanese maples. You sure do. Uh, it may not work uh, depending on the species or the variety. Sure, there's a lot of variation in, in even in a, the same species, like Japanese right. maples, like Acer palmatum. Some work great, some, some are don't. much touchier, so right. it, it pays to experiment. And I see including you've got bonsai you do that too oh yes yes i enjoy the small trees and pots and i'm even now doing bigger trees and pots that was a volunteer in my home in south dakota when i lived there this this it's, particular tree it's an amur maple mm -hmm. and it makes a great 
bonsai. They really can't grow Japanese maples up there, so this is their kind of yeah, it's too cold small up there. maple. But the only thing is, I've re tried to reduce the leaves on it, and it keeps coming back with a vengeance. Yeah, so those are vigorous trees, yes, actually, in, yes. in nature. I notice. I mean, you have a real vision for this garden. It's not just sort of happenstance. You've designed it to, to for enjoyment. Yes, it's, this is a primarily a garden for people. Uh, I've, I've got over 24 different benches and chairs wow. in the garden just, you know, for, and yeah, it makes it harder is... for me to work now because I get to sit <laughs> down and rest. And the next thing I know, an hour has gone by. And Well, yeah. You know. <laughs> and I see bird feeders everywhere. Oh, I mean, lots of birds. Oh, it's wonderful. Over 50 different varieties I've identified in my yard alone. Well, one thing I, I notice is that you've just got a number of, I mean, it's like everything is this beautiful specimen. And let's talk about this, this maple right here because this is an unusual tree. In this area, yeah. yes, this is an Acer japonican. It's uh, in the fall. It's noted for its fall color. It's uh, it's uh, dancing piece. peacock is the name of it. The leaf size shape is unusual, and the colors in the fall is yellow, red, and orange. It's just a absolutely gorgeous tree. Well, it's really beautiful. Most of the Japanese maples that people put in are palmatums. Palmatums, yes. This is japonicum, which is actually means Japanese. This is the, the other Japanese maple. And I love the way you've layered things because over this Japanese maple is this beautiful blue atlas cedar. In terms of getting contrast for a garden, I think scale is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with size. And it's important that things be different in size but not too different. I mean, they have right. to complement each other. They have to relate to each other, right. yes. But uh, the, this uh, cedar is the one that catches people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And they either hate it or love it. A lot of people will look at it and say, oh, Charlie Brown Christmas tree. <laughs> and they won't think about the color contrast and the needle size and everything else that goes on with this tree. You are obviously a really thoughtful designer of your garden here and I'm noticing wonderful contrasts and sizes and tell me about how you think that sort of thing. There's through. four things that I look at primarily. The first one is color that's not necessarily the most important. The next one is form. What tree or plant, what shape it is, is right, it unusual? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the next one is size or scale mm -hmm. and then the fourth thing is texture. Mm -hmm. Whether you know the, it's a fine leaf or whether it's right. a broad leaf or a compound leaf, right? And if I can get three out of four of those things to contrast within my vignette that I'm mm -hmm. working on, I'm going to have an interesting garden. So you look at a little space, and right, and I do one space at a time, right. and then when I go to do the next space, right. I make sure it doesn't, it flows right from with one the to first the other. one that I did. And I notice so, you use a lot of. Art, hard, object, and hard hardscape scaping. is really important. Mm -hmm. And there's natural hardscape like the tree trunks and the rocks and the rocks. Uh -huh. And then there's man-made, which sure. are the statues These beautiful and things. the lights. These lights mm -hmm. are actually functional. Okay. And that's there's probably more of them than what I truly like to see. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's and then of course you've got the the chairs, the benches. Sure. The the, the human things. All of those things, but. Uh, but I and love they that. all have some kind of meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this guy down here, the monk. Right. You know, he's traveling through. What kind of things has he right. has he seen and done? What does he think of the garden? You know, and the cyclamen next to him. Isn't you that know, lovely? That, uh, I I think that that's part of what makes a garden interesting. And then over behind you there, we've got the dragons, mm -hmm. and the dragons symbolize. Oh yeah. Uh, they're the protectors of the garden. They're, uh, they're, you know, supposed, they're kind of like our dogs. And mm -hmm. you have a few, I have a couple of, uh, of the Japanese dogs too. But, oh, uh, right. And then you've got hardscape like your bird baths and your mm -hmm. fountains and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And your arbors and your bird feeders and your chimes. Mm -hmm. And all of that kind of adds to the enjoyment of the garden. Particularly, you know, there's, there's the sound. How does the garden sound? Right. Later on, we'll hear the stream. That gives one kind of sound. And when the wind is blowing, the chimes sure. give another kind. And when there's not so many people here, 
you'll hear the birds. Yes. And that gives another kind of sound. And so. I'm seeing like four seasons of thought here too, because you use a lot of conifers and There's, evergreens. I can come out to this right. garden any time of the year mm -hmm. and find things of interest. Look at this gorgeous I pine. don't buy things for their flowers, mm -hmm. but I do have flowers the year round. I have stuff that flowers in the middle of winter. Mahonia, the... Uh, do you what? have hellebores? Hellebores, yeah. mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. that, couple other things there they may be small but it's sort of fun when you see the bees out uh, yeah. pollinating sure. these flowers you know and these beautiful forms just really add so much I love this pine weeping over this that place. was man-made the yeah. form so you I created took a, this. A, an upright and I pulled it down with uh, with ropes and twisted it poked and it bonsai basically it's a big bonsai of, yeah, kind yeah well yeah. we would call that niwaki okay in the japanese <laughs> form it's called niwaki it's really beautiful and it's doing uh, an unusual form to this is what just would a, be a, standard. a regular white pine a american white pine it was collected at about six inches high wow that's beautiful so it just, and i in the fall this place must be awesome a paradia oh yes. my gosh the color of those in the fall is amazing. persian paradia yeah that that's a uh, the thing that's interesting now, and it's just coming into being, is the bark on it is starting to mm -hmm. show up, it particularly flakes. at the base of the trunk, you'll see. And as the tree gets older, the bark on this tree will show up as mm -hmm. modeled, oh. and it'll, it's interest year round. You have so many beautiful Japanese maples, and I know you told me some of them are just volunteers that yeah. you taken up. I dig up the ones that seem to have an unusual form or leaf structure. Yeah, I do and, the same thing. <laughs> and, uh, and see if I can bonsai them and if they mm -hmm. survive in, in a pot, I know I can find a spot in the garden for them. I may plant them. Oh sure, like, this, look at that. That one is a real unusual one. That's a, like a tabletop. Yeah, it's, uh, I it's love an it. It's Acer palmatum and I'm going to have to look a little. Kirohimi Yatsabusa, something Alrighty. like that. It's uh, and then this one has these crispy curled up. Shishi leaves. Garcia. Yeah. This is uh, lion's head. Is yes, the common name. Yes, that's a very famous. Beautiful one. fall color. This is mm. one of the last trees to color up Beautiful. in the fall. It's almost winter before this colors up and really loses its leaves. And tell me about this maple. I've never this seen this before. This is a ma maple out of Iran, and we thought we could bonsai it, but it doesn't have much of a trunk. But the leaf structure is very unusual on it. I believe it's Acer montapillium or something like that. I've never seen this plant. It's remarkable. It's real unusual. I, I got it from a bonsai guy, Randy Davis, and he's a true expert in bonsai as opposed to me that I kind of just piddle around with it. But uh, it's, pretty it's an un very unusual, and it's been in the ground there for a long time, so it's very slow growing. This is another unusual form uh, this uh, this is a beach. Wow, American beach, and wow. and it comes out of the ground down here. here and it puts another root down here. Wow, and I planted that rock in the middle and then we kind of hung it over the pond. That is to beautiful. Add interest and make it look natural. Well, your koi seem to like it. My oh, yes. goodness, that is a gorgeous Japanese maple draped over the pond there. Tell me about that. That's a Nabishadari. That's a tree that when I first got it was more, uh, it was lower, much lower, mm -hmm. and it was impinging on my uh, path, so I pulled it up and I had it up for a year, and now it's gotten a height that's probably pretty unusual for a tree. It's, it's another way to change the form of a tree is to, you know, you can do it with wires, you can mm -hmm. do it with poles, there's all kinds of things you can do to make things a little taller than what they would normally be or a little shorter than sure. what they would normally be. Well, I just love the form of it. It's really beautiful. And the koi really seem to enjoy being Well, they there. like to eat the leaves that, <laughs> that come down into the pond. Oh, they, really? Uh, that's how it stays that's elevated. How I don't have to get the... in there and prune that. This is uh, Thumbergini, Pinus Thumbergini. And uh, it's it's uh, it's a variety called Arakawa Shoal. Yeah, that's the Japanese black And pine. Uh, not only is it uh, has is it an unusual form in that it's not straight upright, it likes to contort somewhat, but we've also pruned on it and we do candle pruning in the spring and needle pruning in the fall and we just needle pruned it to bring it down better into scale. So I it's can not see your whole thinking here on how you made a vignette out of this space. 
it's really beautiful with the the different textures of the carex, the the sedge coming up, and the right. and the softness of that Inaba Shadari behind, and this beautiful angular, almost architectural pine. One of the things that happens, particularly in ponds, is that the the uh, plant material, if you have, especially if you have a lot of fish, grows like crazy. Sure, it's And so your scale can get way out of whack. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to be very selective. Now I've got three different varieties of, this, of the uh, sedge and, mm -hmm. and uh, they're all within scale for this size right. pond. Yeah, that but looks beautiful. But I used to have water iris and it would grow so yeah, big I guess like that, that huh? it, it just didn't fit the pond right. And right. I also had some other things in there that just they just didn't uh, look right mm -hmm. as they got too big. So Boy, that time is happening. Yeah, that's elfin time. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And then there's mother of time in there too. Mm-hmm. They and, both look really happy. And it happy. really likes it there. I tried. Uh, I, at one time, I had six different varieties of thyme in here oh, wow. along the pond edge. And what survives, we keep. What no doesn't, kidding. we don't. That's you another know? plant where some of it is really rugged and, and grow anywhere and other, and the rest of it always dies. You, you know, know, sometimes things are the opposite from the way you think, too. I used to think that the, the skinny leaf Japanese maples mm -hmm. were going to fry because the leaves look right. so uh, delicate. Delicate, yeah. right, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. But I found it's just the opposite. The Japanese maples that have the really big fat leaves they don't do well they scorch. in yeah. sun, uh -huh. and the the skinny ones do fine in full sun. There you go. So, well, it, it, you know, as gardeners, we're always learning anyway. Always, it never stops. This pine is a Scotch pine on a standard. It's Isn't a dwarf gorgeous? Scotch. It's like a big muffin. And we we've pruned on it some, but not a lot to keep it in this round shape. But look at the trunk on that thing. It How is old so, is that plant? Well, you I, say? I got that from a box store about probably 16, 17 years ago. Yeah. Wow. And it was just in a five or 10 gallon bucket. It wasn't a, wasn't that a big. big. No, <laughs> no, it's, but it's done very well Yeah, here. it's happy. Leon, I really love this view. It is just a great example of the right plant in the right place and just looking wonderful where it's situated. And tell me, what, what kind is this? I think it's Emerald Spreader. I bought several of them and this one has done great. The ones in deeper shade that are further up in the garden have really struggled. One of them is not looking good at all, but uh, and I'll probably wind up taking it out. But this one is just loves it here. It gets a little more light. So on, like some of the yews we think you know, of as a shade plant, mm -hmm. I think this one really likes more sun. It gets afternoon sun, so it right. gets the heat of the day, and it really has thrived here. I've done very little pruning on it, trying to keep it in a natural form. I do occasionally take out any leaders that are kind of going yeah, just sort of straight up in the air, you know, because kind of yeah. I don't want it to grow that way. I want to be able to see the pond. Sure. At the same time, I like that it hangs over the pond because that gives it a more natural look. That's and what again, trees want to do. And it's evergreen. You've got a lot of deciduous yes. stuff around, so it's, it's there right. all winter. Well, and one of the things, even though something is deciduous, for instance, that Anabi Shadari that we were looking at, mm -hmm. if you came back in the winter and looked at that, you'd say, what an interesting form on the that. The shape of it. Because yeah. the branches go everywhere, and this one too. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a garnet here, yeah. up here on this side is a garnet. And that's got a little different uh, form than the Anabi Shadari. But they both are dissectums, and they're great. I love this little path you've installed here along the edge of your property. It's charming. Thank you. You know, one of the things that we've tried to do is uh, utilize the space and to try to hide this concrete ditch that's over here that yeah. I've got to work against. And by putting things of interest along the edge, like mm -hmm. this this uh, spruce here. I love this thing. This yeah, is it's gorgeous. got real unusual color. And, this is Skylands? Skylands, yeah. It's mm -hmm. real hardy here. It seems to like it in full sun. Yeah. I've got another one that's in more shade, and it's not showing this pretty right. golden color yeah, like this one is. So it, it really needs to be in full sun if possible. And I really like the way you've done this little channel here to get the uh, water off the We had a little water drainage mm -hmm. problem here, so we just put this in That's very dry creek bed. And, and a nice it flat adds, slab. It adds interest and, mm -hmm. and it makes it more of a stroll through type garden. Here's another one of these little seating areas you've created, which is just charming beyond belief. I love this thing. Yeah, the grandkids love it too. We sit here and we play tic-tac-toe, and, <laughs> and I'll I see sit that. here and watch the birds, and because uh, I've got bird feeders around, and 
And uh, th this is a one-person bench. There's one spot on each of these, which is well, I can see. real comfortable. But well, you wouldn't want to sit over no, here. No, it's not. It's a little bit, <laughs> but it's an interesting. It's a natural form. It's lovely. And it's, it's recycled teak. It's the roots from from teak trees that really? would have just been burned, and they've made them into benches. And, and I of course, think it's really famous cool. for weathering in this yes. beautiful silvery gray. Right. That's gorgeous. I just love it. What a lovely little setting that is. Oh, wow, look at what you've done with the slope. That is just beautiful. Thank you. That was a problem area when we first moved here. It was a slippery, slidey slope of grass. Yeah. And we had a timber wall in there that got religion mm -hmm. and became holy, and so we had to take the wall down. This area was designed by my son, who's a landscaper. It includes a lot of unusual specimens. This area sloped so badly that he brought in these big boulders and did a wall here and there mm -hmm. to kind of hold things in place, augmented the soil, and I, I think it turned out really nice. Oh, I'm quite beautiful. pleased with it. I like to sit in the patio area down here and just enjoy it, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those areas that it's a problem area, but if you do it right, and a lot of people in this area have slopes, have hills, sure. and don't know what to do with them, and this is a low maintenance, easy care type of landscape once it's in. It's very right. difficult to put in. He used a machine on some of these boulders. Yeah, the boulders weigh tons. But, but once they're there, they're there. Right. Yeah, they're not going to rot. They're not going to go anywhere. No. So it's beautiful. I love the layers and the different textures and, 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 and this shapes. Is a, this area is a night garden, too. We have lights that shine up through that. It just really is cool looking at night. Oh, it's just beautiful. Your whole garden is just beautiful. Leon, well, I want to thank you so much for giving us this spectacular tour you could spend hours here just looking at every time you go around a corner there's something else well thank you yeah it's wonderful yeah còn còn lâu tao mới ngủ ngon nha mày Ủa giật mình cũng được á Tao nói rồi khi nào tao ngủ ngon Thì tao mới chúc ngủ ngon Còn còn lâu tao mới ngủ ngon nha mày Mất chúc đi Chúc ngủ ngon <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bag at a time. Exactly. <laughs> but it makes it so that you yeah. can get to your plants. Right. Right. And work with them. Right. And and thank you. We work on it and the idea is something doesn't thrive, there's a whole lot of other plants we can put in its place. There you go. So, you know, that's part of what we work on. I used to try to save every plant, but I don't do that anymore. If it's well. if it doesn't work there, I'll try it in a different spot and if it still doesn't work then it's probably not the right plant for this area. Sure. Even though it might be a Japanese maple, and I've got lots of different Japanese maples. You sure do. Uh, it may not work uh, depending on the species or the variety. Sure, there's a lot of variation in, in even in a, the same species like Japanese right. maples, like Acer palmatum. Some work great, some, some are don't. much touchier. So right. it, it pays to experiment. And I see, including, you've got bonsai. You do that too. Oh yes, yes, I enjoy the small trees and pots. And I'm even now doing bigger trees and pots. That was a volunteer in my home in South Dakota when I lived there. This, this it's, particular tree? It's an amur maple, mm -hmm. and it makes a great bonsai. They really can't grow Japanese maples up there, so this is their kind of yeah, it's too cold small maple. But the only thing is, I've re tried to reduce the leaves on it, and it keeps coming back with a vengeance. Yeah, so those are vigorous trees, yes, actually, in, yes. in nature. I notice, I mean, you have a real vision for this garden. It's not just sort of happenstance. You've designed it to, to for enjoyment. Yes, it's, this is a primarily a garden for people. Uh, I've, I've got over 24 different benches and chairs wow. in the garden just, you know, for 
And yeah, it makes it harder is... for me to work now because I get to sit <laughs> down and rest. And the next thing I know, an hour has gone by. And, well, yeah. You know, <laughs> and I see bird feeders everywhere. Oh, I mean, lots of birds. Oh, it's wonderful. Over 50 different varieties I've identified in my yard alone. Well, one thing I've, I notice is that you've just got a number of, I mean, it's like every 